Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, David Lepofsky. I'm a visiting professor at the Osgood Hall Law School. As I talk to you today, I'll be drawing on a couple of other hats I wear or roles I play. I'm the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, a province-wide coalition that advocates for the effective implementation of Ontario's accessibility laws, for which we fought uh, long and hard. I'm also going to uh, wear the hat as chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee of the Toronto District School Board. I'll be drawing on what I've learned in, in that role as well. Um, if anyone wants uh, to learn more about the topics I'm going to be discussing today, let me just offer a few resources. You can always follow me on Twitter, and I encourage you to do that, at David Lepofsky, D-A-V-I-D-L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y. Um, you can visit our website, www.aodaalliance.org. If you want to get our email updates, send an e a request to AODA feedback at gmail.com and just say, sign me up. Uh, and if you want to learn particularly about the topic I'm going to be speaking today, the need for Ontario to enact a, uh, an education accessibility standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, go to this particular uh, location I'll give you, and there's lots there for you to read. It's www.aodaalliance.org slash education. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you today. I want to talk to you about why Ontario needs to agree to develop and act and enforce an education accessibility standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. Well, what's the problem? Well, before we get to education, I want to talk to you about what the problem is more generally. We, we live in a society here in Ontario, and indeed in Canada, and frankly around the world, we live in a, a society that was organized, built, and operated for many, many years on the unfair notion uh, that it's only really to be used by people without disabilities. The buildings we build, the public transit we, we acquire, the jobs, uh, uh, workplaces, the products on the market, uh, the restaurants we go to, the stores, uh, even the laws we operate under eight, are all designed on this premise, not because someone sat down and decided to do it that way, it's just the way we've done things for far too long. That meant that we ended up with a world full of barriers that, that hurt everybody with any kind of disability, whether it's a physical disability, mental disability, sensory disability, intellectual disability, mental health condition, whatever it may be. Well, the good news is that we passed a new law back in 2005 after many of us fought for it uh, for a decade uh, that says this has got to change, that says we've got to become fully accessible. That's the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. It's timely that we're discussing this today on November 29th, 2016, because it was, this is our anniversary, it's our birthday. It's, it was 22 years ago today that 20 or so of us ended up in a committee room at Queen's Park, um, angry that we weren't getting the action we needed. We formed a new coalition uh, back on November 29, uh, 1994. I ended up uh, later becoming its, its leader, its co-chair and then its chair. We fought a 10-year uh, campaign that in 2005 won the enactment of the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, uh, a law that requires the Ontario government to lead us to full accessibility by 2025. So that's good, we've got that tool available. But let's drill right into education. What's the problem in education? Why, why do we need an education accessibility standard? Well, our education system, from top to bottom in Ontario, is designed and has been for many, many years on the same unfair, absurd premise that the rest of our society is designed on. It was designed for, for many years as if it was there to serve students without disabilities. Students with disabilities become an afterthought that have to shoehorn their way in to a system that wasn't designed for them. Now, when I talk about education system, I'm talking about it at all levels, from preschool to school to post-secondary uh, education in colleges and universities to job training programs. And 
When I talk about disabilities, I mean all kinds of disabilities. Physical, mental, sensory, neurological, the whole spectrum. Now, how bad is it? Well, it's so bad that even as recently as two decades ago, the terminology we used to use in our school system for students without disabilities was we called them normal students. In the disability rights movement, we like to call that the N-word. The idea that students with dis without disabilities are normal and everybody else is abnormal, students with disabilities are abnormal, is inherently troubling, not just a matter of terminology. I, I care about terminology, but it's not the big thing. It's the action I worry about. The whole thing is that our school system was designed just to serve so-called normal students. Students who weren't normal were called exceptional pupils. And while we've dropped the word, the, the N-word, our special education laws still call students with disabilities exceptional pupils. And exceptional doesn't mean glowing, shining, and wow, you're exceptional. If you're an exceptional student, it means you're not normal. So we drop the N-word, but we still imply it. Not only that, but we don't, even in our education legislation, we don't refer to them as students with disabilities. They're called students with exceptionalities. And we, we, we uh, so we frame this from top to bottom on that way. And the, here's how it works. Our school system, our education system, is built as if they're not there. Example, the built environment. Let me take you through some of the barriers that we face. The built environment, just the buildings that we provide education in. The Toronto District School Board is Canada's biggest school board. It has 550 schools. We learned on the Toronto District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee because we asked that at the start of 2016, the number of the, how many of those 550 schools were wheelchair accessible according to the TDSB's own measure of accessibility? The answer? 85, just 85. Why is that wrong? Because it's 2016. And by the way, the TDSB did not, when we raised this, have a comprehensive plan to get from 85 to 550 by 2025, the deadline that the AODA sets. This isn't just a problem for schools. Colleges and universities are the same thing. Historically, buildings were built as if they were not meant for people with disabilities. And even now, you might think, well, we know better now. We've got better laws, we've updated them, that's great. Well, not so fast. There are inadequacies in our building code and our AODA standards so that buildings built now still have accessibility barriers. Why today? Uh, the AODA Alliance, to mark our 20th, 22nd anniversary, we just made public a video available on YouTube. It's got a search on AODA Alliance and Centennial College. You see, there's a brand new building in Toronto built with your tax dollars at Centennial College, a new culinary arts center. It's a lovely building. They try to do accessibility, but our video shows a series of accessibility blunders. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the new Student Learning Center right in the heart of downtown Toronto for Ryerson University, the same thing. Osgoode Hall Law School right here at York University is a building I was able to study in 40 years ago as a blind uh, law student. I learned my way around within a couple of hours and bombed around it, no problem on my own. Well, it wasn't great for wheelchair access then. They've done a major renovation in recent years. They did improve wheelchair accessibility, but they made it actually one of the worst buildings I've tried to navigate as a blind person. They made it worse, substantially worse. That's not easy to do. Um, and it, it, this is a problem in no small part because if, if you ask the folks who do it, they'll, well, you know, we did what the law required. Well, they did not enough because the law isn't good enough, the building code at least. But those aren't the only barriers. The, stu the teachers who teach our kids in school, 
are a barrier. They're good people, they want to do well, but when they went to teacher's college, there were two streams. There was teachers who were trained to teach so-called normal students, and that's who they're trained to teach. And then for the other kids, there's another stream. Those are special education stu teachers. The students are called students with special education needs, and what they get is called special education. Even the terminology is troubling. Again, I'm not a terminology guy, I'm an action guy. But here's what happens from that kind of action. When you want to get kids with disabilities educated in the mainstream wherever possible because it's educationally and socially better for everybody, what you end up with are teachers in the mainstream who weren't trained to teach them. Because from day one in teacher's college, they may, for, for years, for decades, they were just trained to teach so-called normal students. So the same problem with the design of buildings applies to the design of the teachers. It doesn't stop there. The digital equipment that we deploy in our schools, whether it's in colleges or universities or in, in uh, uh, schools, that digital equipment, uh, online learning, all of it's huge change in our education system, increasingly important all the time. But there's been no concerted effort to ensure that when our public money is used to buy that digital equipment and the applications and software that will be used on it, that we make sure that we buy products that are built on principles of universal design, that will be equally usable by students with disabilities. Instead, uh, too often, I'm not saying all the time, but too often, Students with disabilities, excuse me, have to fight a rear guard action, figure out how to shoehorn their way into technology they can't use that was designed as if they weren't there, just like shoehorning them into the buildings that may have been designed as if uh, they weren't there. But digital equipment's not the only thing. And by the way, th this is, the, the area of digital equipment is the area where we should be able to do the, do the best the quickest, the digital, te digital technology we will use in our schools, in our colleges and universities five years from now, hasn't been bought yet, hasn't even been ordered yet, it hasn't even been designed yet. If we made sure now that what we deploy later will be fully accessible, if our law required that in the learning environment, we could solve this problem. That's not all. What about the curriculum we teach in our schools? Now you might figure, well, curriculum is just curriculum. You should just teach what there is to teach. In our curriculum, some of it comes from the province, then the lesson plans are designed in the schools. There's various hands that uh, uh, have a hand on how this is uh, done. Well, the old way of doing education was, here's your curriculum, sink or swim. It's designed for the so-called normal student. And if you've got disabilities, well, we've got to figure out how we're going to accommodate you. Well, there's been a change in the world of products. We used to design our products the same way. And if you want a smartphone? Here's your smartphone. If you've got a, a disability, you can't use it, go pay for some fancy adaptive equipment to make it work. And you can shoulder the cost personally. The new way of designing products is called universal design. Uh, in front of me is an iPhone that's recording uh, this lecture. Um, iPhones and all Apple products are built and designed on principles of universal design. They include the adaptive technology built right in. Doesn't cost an extra dime or indeed a penny. Universal design is where you design a product so it can be used by people with a range of different abilities, not just assuming that everybody has two working eyes, two working ears, to working hands and, and feet and so on. Uh, well, the same principle, universal design, can be applied to the way we teach, to our school curriculum and lesson plans. And there's a name for it. We call it universal design in learning, UDL. Same principle applied to how we deliver the product of education. Now, there's a lot of work been done out there on UDL, but I dare say uh, uh, that we can't, uh, in the year 2016, all the teachers on the front line of our education system, all the professors on the front line of our 
post-secondary education system have not been trained in, how to, in UDL so that they can deploy those principles in their classrooms. Now, hopefully some teachers get it anyway or learn to do it or figure it out, but if you don't train them to do it, if you don't monitor to make sure that they got the tools to do it and that they're doing it right, help them out to do better. If you don't have a system in place, you're gonna end up with problems, and we certainly do. That's not all. What about the playground equipment or the gym equipment in our schools? What about the experiential learning programs that we have? The most recent throne speech here in Ontario promised that every student in Ontario schools would get one, at least one, experiential learning opportunity. That's critical for moving on to employment. It's a wonderful idea, but there's no plan or requirements in place to ensure that experiential learning opportunities are accessible and that those educational organizations that provide them or organize them work with their experiential learning partners to assist them to ensure that that actually happens. No, it's back to the world of students with disabilities having to sink or swim in a world that was designed as if they're not there. Now again, I'm not saying that nobody does anything about this and nobody cares. Individual educational institutions, teachers and others do care and want to do better, but they're all working in a system that's designed uh, to make it harder for students with disabilities. Not on purpose, but just because that's the way the world's been operating. That's, as I've been saying, not all. There are other kinds of uh, barriers that come into play. The way we test students is not designed from the beginning to ensure that it fully accommodates a diverse range of learning styles and needs. It's up to each teacher, if a student has, uh, has difficulties in, these con in that context, to try to figure it out themselves or maybe find somebody in the educational organization to help them figure it out. Swimming against the current. Not only that, but we can end up with bureaucratic barriers. For example, some students with autism benefit, and some children and adults with autism benefit from having the, a, a service animal with them. May help them self-regulate, may help them uh, function better in a social environment. What happens if they want to bring that service animal to school? Some school boards say yes, some say no, some have no policy, some say, well, you could bring the dog, but if the dog poops, mom or dad have to leave work immediately to come and clean it up. Why should parents in every part of Ontario have to battle for the same kind of accommodation that all students with service animals should be guaranteed as a matter of right. Why should each school board have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to service animals, or buildings, or digital equipment, or curriculum, or all the other barriers I've talked about? Now, those are recurring barriers in the environment where we educate kids. And our government, and our school boards are, have said that they're committed to expanding opportunities for students with disabilities to be educated in the mainstream. They call it inclusive education. And that's fantastic. And they should be commended for that. However, however, the problem is you can't do effective inclusion if you're trying to include them in a mainstream that's full of accessibility barriers. It's, it's going to cost you more. It's going to require more effort. You're going to run into more roadblocks. It's harder to do. So an education system that's full of accessibility barriers is one which makes inclusion far harder to achieve. But even when we talk about inclusion, or whenever we talk about inclusion, it's important to understand what we mean. We do not mean taking a kid with a disability and simply dumping them into a mainstream class and say, having a, say have a good time. In that class, there needs to be the kinds of supports 
and accommodations necessary to address their particular learning style. And, and the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights happily cover this. There's a very important fundamental duty to accommodate students with disabilities to ensure that they can fully benefit from education. And educators have to meet that duty to accommodate unless they can prove it's impossible to do any more without undue hardship to them. And a school board as big as Toronto District School Board is going to have a lot of trouble showing undue hardship to as well-resourced an organization as it, depending on the accommodation. If it's not the individual school's budget that you test the duty to accommodate against. It's the whole school board. But one way or another, even if we increase the accessibility of the mainstream classroom, there will always be a need to look at each student uh, with a disability and determine, do they have accommodation needs and how should that be uh, dealt with? Well, we have two barriers that come into play right now that get in the way of achieving that goal. And they are very serious barriers. The first barrier is an information barrier. It is very hard for students with disabilities and their families, in too many cases, to just find out what options and supports are available for them and how to access them, who to go to, who to convince. If you're not happy, where to go after that? And if you can't find out what's on the menu or how to order it, you're going to have a whole lot of trouble getting your meal. Well, as an example, the Toronto District School Board, we found this as a recurring complaint from parents. And it's so bad that I have labeled the Toronto District School Board like a restaurant that won't give you a menu. It can get that bad. And so one of the areas where a barrier needs to be, one of the recurring barriers that needs to be addressed is the difficulty in just finding this information out. You can't effectively advocate for your own accommodation or that of your kids if you can't find that information out that you need to be able to, to know what, what's on the menu and how to order it. That's a bureaucratic barrier in and of itself. There's one more. And it's the last one I'm going to put on this rather distressing list. For a student with a disability who needs accommodation and needs to try to work out some kind of adjustment or support service in the educational environment, whether in school or college or university, it's a really difficult process we have for them to navigate. And it's a process that parents and families and students find over and over can be uh, very difficult uh, to manage from beginning to end. Now, I'm not saying there are people out there trying to make it harder and trying to be obnoxious or whatever. It's just you're trying to get you got, whether it's a school or a college or university, you got a big organization, and it's designed to deliver educational services uh, to a large number of people. And you come along and you want them to do something differently, Make, getting any large organization to try to do something differently is an uphill battle by definition. Even if there are people within the organization, and certainly within our educational organization, there are many who want to do the right thing, who want to be helpful. Again, I'm not impugning anybody's motives or how much they care and all that kind of stuff at all. I'm talking about bureaucratic systems that get in the way. Well, let me just describe to you the nature of the problem in Ontario, just in the school system, and then I'll tell you about college and universities. And that will complete my narrative of what, what the problem is. So let's start with thinking about the way the world should work. If you were a student with a disability in a school, or the parent of a student with a disability in a school. Uh, you would wanna, uh, and, and we had to figure out what, like what's the best way to meet your educational needs. There's a sequence that would make sense. 
it would make sense to first figure out what your needs are. What are your disability-related education needs? And then we need to figure out, number two, what are the supports or services or adjustments you need to meet those needs? Seem logical? And then once we figure that out, come up with a plan for it, then we should say, okay, where within the education system is the most effective place to meet your needs? Now that makes sense, right? It's not the way we do it in Ontario. We do it completely differently. What do we do? First, under our special education legislation, which have been in place for 36 years, was enacted before the charter existed and before the human rights guaranteed any rights to people with disabilities. And believe me, it shows both its age and its uh, creation before these rights, these fundamental constitutional and quasi-constitutional rights, rights were, were on the books. This is the way we do it. Uh, we are supposed to first decide on your placement, meaning uh, whether you're going to be, I, I think it means, they don't define it in the, especially in the Education Act, but it's treated uh, in many cases as meaning whether you're going to be educated in a mainstream setting or a segregated setting. By the way, the government tends to use a, and school boards often use a kind of a euphemism they call classes which only have students with disabilities congregated sites. So it sounds like a church or a synagogue or a mosque, right? They go for a congregation. It's segregation, let's call it that. Sometimes it's justified, but let's call it what it is. Um, um, so first, they want to identify, uh, actually, let me go back a step. The first thing they want to do is identify whether you have a disability that is, or a condition that is recognized in our special education laws. And they, as I told you earlier, are called exceptionalities. And our first problem is that the list of exceptionalities in the regulations and in the legislation does not include all disabilities covered by the Human Rights Code and the Charter. The, most, the single most um, obvious omission is that it does not include all mental health conditions. It only includes them if they lead to what the special education provisions call a behavior issue. So if you've got a mental health issue that makes you act out, you have an exceptionality under our special education laws. If you have a mental health condition that doesn't lead you to misbehave, but it does affect your educational needs, you're not covered. Unless you can figure a way to slip into one of the, one of the other categories. Again, this is because our, school, our teachers and our principals and our trustees don't want to meet the needs of these kids. It's the shackles of an outdated education law that they work under. So first we've got to identify whether you've got an exceptionality within the meaning of the special education laws, which is by definition too narrow. Then we've got to decide on your placement, which as I said relates to, is treated uh, in many cases relating to whether you're in a segregated classroom or a mainstream classroom. And that's done through a committee at the school board created under the education laws called an Identification and Placement Review Committee, or IPRC. It's a committee within the school board that the parents or student appear before, and it decides whether you are to be identified as having an exceptionality, and if so, what your placement should be. Remember that, however, it cannot make a decision on what services or program you get at that placement. The law makes that very clear. This IPRC can make recommendations on the services or programs you get, but those aren't binding on the school board. You can appeal, if you don't like the decision on identification or placement, but you can't appeal the recommendations on program or services. What does this mean in the real world? It means they can decide you go to, special, to a segregated setting, but they can't, this, or an integrated setting, mainstream setting, but they can't direct, and you can't get them to direct and decide what supports and services you get there. Well, a placement is meaningless, respectfully, without the decision on 
the accommodation supports and services you get there. A mainstream placement could be really effective, but only if you get the proper supports. It might be something that's completely unacceptable without those supports. But the IPRC doesn't decide the whole package of needs. It decides this narrow, barren um, placement issue. By the way, the Act doesn't even define placement. And so it's open to school boards to some extent to have some leeway in how much is placement, how much is programs, how much is services. There's some case law on it, but it, it's not uh, uh, as helpful as we need. Um, after your placement is decided, then the school board is required to develop an individual plan on how your needs will be met there. It's called an individual education plan, or IEP. The special education regulations require the school board to consult with the student or family, but DOTS does not mandate a process that ensures that you are included from the beginning fully and fully listened to. Moreover, it guarantees no right of appeal either within the school board or to an education tribunal or elsewhere if either the uh, you don't think the individual education plan is sufficient, or if it's a great plan, but the school board doesn't implement it effect as, as promised. If you're not happy with any of this, and if you don't have a right of appeal, there's only one place you can go. You file a human rights complaint, go to the human rights tribunal, you gotta try to hire a lawyer or hope you can get one uh, available to you through the underfunded and overworked human rights legal support center. And then you will be up against a school board that can use tax dollars to hire high-priced counsel to fight you every step of the way for months or years. That is not a system designed to be inclusive and, um, and fair. It is a system designed to give school boards, well-intentioned school boards, all the power and families and students the least input shy of no input. Now, that's not to say all school boards do the least they have to. Some can do more. But if they do it, it's because they choose to do it, or a particular principal or teacher decides to do it, not because it's a guaranteed across the board. What do we know the result of this is? Well, we know the result of this is that the students and their families find this process difficult to navigate, even if they can learn about it. I'm not saying nobody gets effectively accommodated, but it's not a system designed to ensure prompt, smooth, effective, fair results. And if you think about it, go back to my model of the way you should do things. You should first figure out your needs, then figure out what, what supports you need, then figure out where to go to place. Here what we do is we, we define needs only in terms of exceptionalities, which is too narrow. Then we decide placement without regard to the services and supports you're gonna get need. And then once we get you there, we'll then decide what services or supports you get. It is a, not a rational, intelligent design uh, for a modern 21st century way of doing things. Now, I'm sure in 1980, it was a real step forward, but been a lot of water under the educational bridge since then. So what's the result of all of this? Let me first talk about numbers. The numbers are these. Oh, excuse me, before I get to this, I gotta explain all of what I just said to you about schools and the process available. There's no counterpart in colleges and universities. It's up to the individual student and the individual college or university to work out whatever they work out possibly one professor at a time, one school at a time. Now there are disability student centers at various universities and colleges who are there trying to help, and they're good people across the board. But it's still, uh, and there's more support than there used to be, which is good. But there is no procedural protection except where co individual colleges or universities decide uh, they wanna create them. And if you're not happy with what you get there, again, you're back to filing a human rights complaint against the college or university that you want to get your education from, a relationship that nobody wants to take on if they can avoid it. 
So what's the consequence of all of this? Well, let me talk numbers in the schools. There are in the Toronto District School Board 240,000 students. This is Canada's biggest school board. The number of students with special education needs that they know of, these are students who've had an IEP, whether or not they've had an IPRC. They've got an individual education plan, even if not, uh, they haven't got, uh, gone to an identification placement review committee. The number is 46,000, one out of every six kids. And that's only the ones we know about. And that's using the definition of exceptionality, which doesn't cover all mental health conditions. And all disability, therefore, doesn't cover all the disabilities. That under the Human Rights Code, there is a duty uh, to accommodate. One out of every six kids, at least, 46,000 kids, students, is more students than in some entire school boards in Ontario. What about across the province? In Ontario government funded schools, that's Catholic schools or public schools, there are two million students total. The number with known to have special education needs is 334,000, a third of a million, one out of every six. Now, I should explain to you that the definition of special education needs or exceptionality, uh, it doesn't include all disabilities, I'll explain, but it also includes gifted children. Now, gifted children may have disabilities, in which case they should be in the disability numbers, but it also includes those who are gifted but have no disabilities, no learning disabilities, no, no physical disabilities, no sensory disabilities, not. But these numbers are still, the, the, the number of students, as I understand it, who are gifted do not, uh, if you took them out of the mix, don't change the enormity of the numbers I'm telling you about. Um, and um, so what we're talking about, what flows from these numbers? And this is before we, we don't, I, I don't have a number for the number of uh, students with disabilities in colleges and universities, but you've got to add to it if you want to look at the whole picture across uh, Ontario. But what does that mean? It means a couple things. One, we've got a school system that has historically been designed on this uh, uh, outdated notion of normal versus uh, not normal students. When we're treating, relegating one out of six to potential second class citizenship status. And we're burdening school boards and teachers with trying to meet their needs by trying to fit them into a system that was not designed as if they were there in the first place. Making that challenge for them even harder. What else does it mean? It means that if, if there are 334 thousand students in Ontario who have an individual education plan, that means there's been 334,000 cases of trying to work out one-off individual accommodations. Well, if we had a barrier-free school system, we'd have fewer of those accommodations to make. And if we had a fairer process of informing families what their rights are and what their opportunities are, and a fairer process to take into account their needs and an appeal process, we could well come up with better results for 334,000 students. That's a lot of individual accommodations to work out. And in a system that essentially leaves it largely to the discretion of individual principals and so on. So we have an outdated system. What's the consequence for, for, uh, of all of this beyond those numbers? No. Here are some of the consequences. Number one, unemployment facing people with disabilities. The unemployment rate that faces people with disabilities, or different numbers are thrown around, but is significantly higher and has chronically been significantly higher than the unemployment rate facing the population at large. The former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, David Onley, himself a person with a disability, has since become the special advisor to the Ontario government on accessibility. And he has said more than once publicly that the unemployment rate facing people with disabilities in this country is not only a national crisis, it's a national shame. 
Well, you can't get a good job if you can't get a good education. And when students with disabilities have to swim up against a, a rough current against them to try to get a good education, that's only going to make it harder to get a good job. That's not all. Families uh, of students with disabilities and the students themselves are put through a process that is very stressful and very difficult for them, having to battle these barriers one at a time. If you're a parent of a kid who's got uh, on the autism spectrum and you've succeeded in getting them a service animal that's really helped them, if you've got to now go and fight your school board just so that the, the child can bring the dog to school after families have had to fight this in other school boards, and if we're burdening this across the province with families, that's another hardship these folks have loaded on them, on top of the challenges they've already got to deal with just trying to get an education. If you've got to take on a school board to try to get them to come up with a good individual education plan, and then have to take on the challenge of getting them effectively implemented, and I'm not saying they're all bad and that nobody implements them, but some are not as good as they should be and some aren't effectively implemented, They've got to face the hardship of this without a, a fair, effective appeal process. That's another hardship. It is another stressor on them. What makes it even more challenging is another barrier in the classroom. Another barrier in the classroom can be the resistance or the unfamiliarity of students without disabilities. That can create an attitudinal barrier. We need a comprehensive strategy in the classroom to, make, to educate students without disabilities about the needs and the inclusion of students with disabilities so that when they get mainstreamed, the classroom is an attitudinally barrier-free place and so that students and their families don't have to face issues of bullying or uh, resistance or exclusion and other kinds of upset that they, that they can face. Now again, not every kid with a disability faces that in the mainstream, but it, they should never face it in the mainstream. Well, beyond the burden on individual kids and parents, there's a burden on educational organizations, and an unfair one. Each one of them is left to reinvent the accessibility wheel one at a time, excuse me, one at a time. Each one of them has to figure out what should a barrier-free, if we're going to build a new school or add a new wing on a school, what do we do? Well, looking at the building code may not be that helpful because it would put grab bars in the bathroom at adult height. Well, two year grade two kids, if they're in a wheelchair, reaching up to an adult height grab bar may be not so effective. But the building code and the AODA standards passed to date, to date don't tell school boards what to do if you're building a new school building or renovating one. And mistakes can be made. And then there's the cost and the frustration and the, the hassles of having to deal with them after the fact. This is a pain for school boards. I got contacted by a mom uh, some time ago because the school at the West End of Toronto was going to get a new addition. First, she was the head of the Parents' Council for the school. She advocated uh, that they include an accessible bathroom. At first, they said no, and then she backed them into saying yes. Then they installed an accessible bathroom. By the way, her kid didn't have a disability, but she was an occupational therapist. She said, we should be doing this. It's like the right thing to do, and she's right. Well, she talked them into doing an accessible bathroom, and the good news is when they installed it, it had an automatic door opener. The bad news is that the button to operate the automatic door opener was only on the inside of the bathroom, meaning you got to get in the bathroom before you could automatic use the power door, but if you need the automatic door opener, you're not going to get in the bathroom. And when she contacted the school board, they said, well, it's what the building code required back then, they didn't have to do anymore. Well, after some further pressure and intervention, uh, they found the money and fixed the switch. But th th this, they would rather get it right the first time too. And we shouldn't have to burden each school board with hiring architects 
We may not know how to design an accessible building and hiring accessibility consultants and then trying to figure it out and maybe getting it wrong, like they just did in Centennial College's Culinary Arts Center. A standard that tells them what to do would save everybody the hassle of reinventing the wheel. The same goes with all the other barriers I told you about. Buying the wrong digital equipment. Better to know what you need to get in the first place saves everybody the burden, the hardship, and the time and the cost of reinventing the wheel. One at university, one college, one school board, or one school at a time. Makes sense. So what do we need? We need an education accessibility standard. That's exactly what the AODA was passed for. The AODA, when we fought for it, when we won it, the reason we got it was to ensure that organizations would know what they've got to do to become accessible and wouldn't have to reinvent the accessibility wheel one organization after another. We won it so that individuals with disabilities wouldn't have to fight barriers over and over, the same barrier over and over, one organization and one barrier at a time. And built into the design of the AODA, um, thankfully, is the capacity for the government to make those rules. They're called accessibility standards. And they can be made one sector at a time. So that, for example, commendably, the Ontario government made an accessibility standard uh, oh, over five years ago in the area of, of public transit to set standards for accessibility in, in buses and subways and taxis and so on. Now, what they passed wasn't as good as what we need, but it was helpful. The government has agreed to develop an accessibility standard at our request in the area of health care. And that's great because same problems exist in our health care system. The same logic that compelled the government to develop an accessibility standard in transit and in uh, health care should drive the Ontario government to readily agree uh, to do so in the area of education. Um, well, who supports us? Well, this is kind of cool. I mean, obviously we're getting support from within the disability community, that could hardly be a surprise. But some might surmise that there'd be pushback from those on the front lines of our education system who've got to actually deliver accessible education because some might surmise that they might say, I'm busy, I don't want to do anymore, whatever. Human nature, some people resist uh, ch changing what they, what they have to do. Well, that's what you might think. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Let me tell you who's already written the government years ago at our request to support our call for an education accessibility standard. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, the union that represents elementary teachers in publish, public English schools. The Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, the union that represents high school teachers in public English schools. The Ontario, uh, pardon me, the uh, Ontario uh, English Catholic Teachers Association, the union that represents English Catholic school elementary and primary school teachers. The Canadian Union of Public Employees Ontario, which represents a number of other workers in the education system. And as for universities, the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations, the provincial voice of the unions that represent university professors. So we're talking about a huge number of those on the front line of our education system. And they're not saying, don't make us do it, don't do anything more. They're saying, Please, we got to do more. And that is a major voice to support us and a major uh, bonus to help make sure an education accessibility standard would, would succeed. Who's come out against us? Well, publicly, nobody. Absolutely, I've, I've seen in, in all the years advocating on this, not a single organization has come out publicly and said, no, we're against it. Well. What would an education, or what could an education accessibility standard include? 
We released a discussion paper a week ago just to throw out some ideas. And, and we've told the government, you don't have to agree to these ideas in order to get started, but in order to say, yes, we would like an education, we'd like to develop an education accessibility standard. But we, we put out some ideas. And I'm going to summarize them, though you can find our discussion paper at www.aodaalliance.org slash education. And we're open to get feedback on what else we could do better. An email sent to aodafeedback at gmail.com with ideas. We'd, we'd welcome any ideas. Um, let me just say a few quick things to summarize it. First, it should cover all levels of education, preschool, school, colleges, universities, job training. Second, it should cover all disabilities. Third, it should have the goal of achieving a fully accessible barrier-free education system for students with disabilities by 2025 by removing existing barriers and preventing new ones. It should address the range of barriers I've described uh, earlier in this talk and any others that people bring forward. The, the recurring barriers in the built environment, the digital environment, the curriculum, the, uh, the playground equipment, teacher training, attitude barriers among students, and so on. And as wind at our sails, the existence of those barriers are not just um, known by us, but fully 13 years ago, the Ontario Human Rights Commission delivered a, a groundbreaking report telling the government that there are recurring accessibility barriers in our education system. And in 2015, the provincial government hired the KPMG consulting firm to look into the education system, and it reported that there were barriers here, and it wrote its report summarizes examples of measures in other provinces or other jurisdictions that we don't have, like a right of appeal if you're not happy with your individual education plan in school. Uh, and you'll see on our website at that link um, an analysis of the KPMG report. We say it shows all the more why we need an education accessibility standard. So a standard could include measures to address these recurring barriers. Let's learn from the boards or from other jurisdictions what they've done right to deal with service animals or the built environment or digital accessibility, and let's set those up as, as standards so that each organization will know what they got to do. The other thing the Education uh, Accessibility Standard um, can and should do is it should remove the bureaucratic barriers that have impede effective individual accommodation. There still will always be a need for individual students with disabilities to get individual accommodations. And so we'd like to see both provisions to ensure parents have a, uh, their right to know the options available to their kids honored and fulfilled, and the right to know how to pursue those options effectively fulfilled. And we'd like to see a modernized process for working out the individual accommodations and appealing if you're not happy with the results or if the results that you were promised aren't actually being delivered. Now, we, a question invariably comes up when you raise this, like, who's going to pay for all this? And our answer is that this should be doable within the government's existing education budget. If they want to add more money, that's great, but we're not saying they've got to come up with new money in order to do this. And no one can argue that this is a new mandate, that we're now imposing new obligations. These requirements have been part of what the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights have imposed for over a third of a century. Those organizations have a duty to accommodate up to undo hardship. And removing and preventing barriers is part of that duty and will make it less costly, more economically efficient, cheaper to deliver these accommodations and will get better results. Organizations that face environmental laws can't get away with saying, we won't obey your environmental laws unless the government pays us to. Same goes for education accessibility. Same way the government was able to create a, a transportation accessibility standard without saying, well, we're going to do this, but first we're going to write you a big check to transit providers or, or others. And the same that they're going to do in the area of, of health care. So um, let me conclude with just a, a couple of important thoughts. Um, where are we at? How's it going? We, I've made the case and, uh, in terms of 
why it's a good idea, why it would benefit everyone, why no one's come out publicly against it. How are we doing politically? And my coalition's nonpartisan. We you know, vote for or against or endorse anybody voting for or against. It's up to every individual to support whatever party they want. But here's where we're at. We first started asking the provincial government to do this at least in 2011, if not sooner. So we're talking over a half a decade. The government hasn't said yes. They haven't said no. They've said they're considering it. They said they're studying it and so on. In the 2014 election in Ontario, um, the New Democratic, we asked all the parties, if elected, would you agree to develop an education accessibility standard? And um, the, the uh, uh, conservatives didn't answer. The NDP said, yes, we would. Didn't answer that question. Uh, they've said they're supportive on education inclusion. The, the NDP said, yes, we would. The Liberals said our next standard would deal with health and or education. So they, they've said maybe. Now, uh, about a month ago, on the 31st of October, the Premier was asked by Conservative uh, opposition member Bill Walker in the question period in the Ontario Legislature, well, you know, why don't you do an education accessibility standard? And Premier Wynn responded that uh, they're considering it. She said that she'd had a recent good meeting with me on behalf of my coalition, the AODA Alliance, and with our new accessibility minister, Tracy McCharles. And she said that she was directing Minister McCharles to meet the education minister and look at what could be done. So it's, it's on the table, but we still don't have a yes. And we're making this a major priority. Now, what's been going on in the meantime? In the meantime, two things are going on. One of which is that uh, my coalition, the AODA Alliance, is organizing to get folks uh, advocating to their members of the Ontario Legislature, whatever be their party, uh, to advocate to, to get the government to say yes. But the other thing is, we're trying to see what we can do at the local level. So my, in my role as the chair of the Toronto District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee, we've been doing starting last January or before, a major review of the delivery of special education of the 46,000 uh, students in the Toronto District School Board's um, mandate to see how things are going and what can be done better. We have a survey for parents, find out what their experiences are. Any of you have any experience with this as students or know others uh, who have or families? Uh, go to SurveyMonkey or go to tdsb.on.ca and you'll find the link to our survey. We're eager for you to fill it out and give us your feedback. Um, but also, my, uh, the Special Education Advisory Committee that I have the privilege of serving, we've actually already passed four major motions last June calling for reforms uh, in the areas of the parents' right to know, the need for a reform process to make it easier to advocate for effective accommodation, the need for digital accessibility, and the need for built environment accessibility. And everything we've recommended to TDSB would make sense at every school board. In fact, the recommendations that we brought forward are quoted in the AODA Alliance's discussion paper for provincial action uh, on an education accessibility standard. So we're trying to get these ideas going um, at the local level while we try to get them adopted province-wide. Because if they work for Toronto, if parents have a right to know in Toronto, they, they ought to have a right to, same right to know in Ottawa, Kenora, Windsor, or wherever, um, without having to fight the same battles. And each school board shouldn't have to work this out again, uh, again and again and again. So in conclusion, you're going to find that people with disabilities and their families are going to be raising their voices, are going to be pressing their members of legislature from all three parties to make progress on this because education underpins everything. It underpins our ability to get a job and our ability to do so much in society. And the very arguments that wisely led the government in 2005 to pass the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, that wisely led the federal government to include disability in the charter in 1980 that, and 81, that wisely led the Ontario legislature to include disability in the Human Rights Code in 
1982 and to strengthen it again four years later, those arguments all point in one direction alone, and that is that we need an education accessibility standard. 